tide zeroing us in on Whitefish Bay. So without further, oh, one more thing. We are all docents at the Milwaukee Public Museum, as, um, as Seth mentioned. This is not a Milwaukee Public Museum program, of course. We are here just as individuals. But we do welcome you to come down and see the exhibits on Native Americans at the museum, uh, both the old museum now for the next couple years and uh, the new museum when it comes in a couple years. OK, we'll turn to Ilka first. And if you would like this, you can have it. Okay, I can usually do a room without a microphone, but I'll use it today so I can make sure I hit everybody. Good morning. My name is Ilka Pollock, and yes, I am one of the Native American docents at the Milwaukee Public Museum. I'm not used to talking to adults. We typically stand and talk to children, so bear with us as we get our bearings with adults. I have a question. Yes. Should we ask you questions? Is that a style to ask? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, let's get started. Oh, we have the first slide. So today we have come to answer a few questions for you. As docents, we are first taught to educate and then leave people thirsting to learn more. Today, we shall try to accomplish that. So let's start from the very beginning. So how did people come? At first, it was thought that people walked across an ice bridge from Asia and Siberia to North America. Now, and you can see on this map all the ice. <clears throat> but why would people walk all that way on ice? They were following delicious food. It's believed that they came in small familial groups and settled in North America. In 2007, so not that long ago, a new theory hit the world. People arriving in North America by sea. It was later called the Kelp Highway. Uh, this disruption in archaeological thinking actually helped explain larger migration along the coasts of North and South America. No matter what theory is the latest and greatest, if you ask Native Americans, they will tell you. They have always been here. Next one. Oh, this is so exciting. This is the Hebeer mammoth. Archaeologists and anthropologists are not perfect. It was once thought that humans were in North America only 13 thousand years ago. But as technology changes, so does theory and history. In Paris, Wisconsin, in Kenosha County, this skeleton was found in a farmer's field. 85% of that mammoth's bones were intact and found with primitive tools. It was these bones that told a significant story. In 1994, um, this find proved to researchers that humans were in Wisconsin 14,500 
to 14,700 years ago. So, you may ask, how did this mammoth prove that humans were in Wisconsin a thousand years earlier? Cut marks. Cut marks on the bones proved that humans had butchered parts of this mammoth. Now, this mammoth is on display at the Milwaukee Public Museum. And you may walk in free. You don't even have to pay. You can walk in the main level and see that guy and his cut marks. The next one. Footprints in New Mexico. In White Sands, New Mexico, ancient footprints have helped move the date of human habitation in North America to more than 23,000 years. These footprints actually tell a pretty familiar story. Found in an area that was once a great lake, these footprints are believed to have belonged to teenagers, probably doing what teenagers have done for millennia. One set of prints appears to be from a female. Her tracks walk along for over a mile. Occasionally, a set of toddler tracks appear beside her tracks. It's believed she was carrying the child and occasionally stopped and set the child down next to her. We are left to speculate what those young ones were doing beside that lake. The next one. Okay, Big Creek. Big Creek is in Door County, is that right? It's up in Door County, and there are some archaeological digs going on currently up there. But I'm going to talk about the woodland period. Now, the woodland period began about 3,000 years ago. It is defined by people moving inland, away from the coasts. It's also defined by an increase in agriculture, the development of better pottery, more permanent settlements, trade of exotic goods, and extensive mound buildings. Let's talk about these mounds. We don't have a... Oh, there it is right there. This mound actually is right near here in what park? Lake, lake park. park. It's in Lake Park right along the lake. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. I haven't been in this side of town for a very long time. So, um, anyway, along with permanent settlements uh, comes ceremonial burials. People started to honor their departed with funerary goods, such as shells, beads, and other important objects, and obviously mounds. Initially, the mounds were cone-shaped. Later, some developed into effigy mounds. Now, not all mounds were burial mounds. Some were thought to have been ceremonial platforms. Now, effigy mounds are mounds that are built to resemble animals. They seem to have been both burial and ceremonial. Wisconsin DNR states that Wisconsin is the geographical center of effigy mound distribution. In the 1600s, it was estimated that Wisconsin was home to more than 20,000 effigy mounds. 
Now this one, wait, this is the rabbit? Yep. This mound, the rabbit effigy mound, um, is in Madison. Now we call it a rabbit, it may have been a fox. Theories of what each mound meant varies. Built in the shapes of birds, fox, panthers, and serpents, they may represent clan boundaries, water sources, hunting grounds, or just seasonal hunting. Ancient works. Ah, I love this map. Um, if you look at the very top of the map, if, if they showed the whole map, you would see Whitefish Bay at the very top along Lake Michigan. This map was created by Increase Lapham. Um, and it shows the mound building or the ancient works in the Milwaukee area. Wisconsin's first great scientist, Increase Lapham, mapped Wisconsin mounds and found many in this area. Next, Bob. Thank you. Okay, so let's get on to some actual tribes. Your question is probably, but who actually lived right here? Um, well, that remains a question that not many people can answer with great certainty. But here's what we know. Uh, through, through migration over centuries, people have found great places to live. People also packed up and moved for any number of reasons. This map shows forced migration of tribal peoples by the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois um, in the 1600s. In, the, in an effort to capture the fur market with the European, Europeans, the Haudenosaunee forced other tribes westward. They wanted all the furs for themselves. Uh, known as the Beaver Wars, this bloody period brought many peoples to the Great Lakes region. Last slide. So this is our area of the majority of the population in 1768. And as you can see from the bottom, the Potawatomi were the people that dominated this area. But by no means were they the only people. So I turn my microphone over to Catherine. Thank you, Catherine Kamenarik. Did you feel the earth shake as Ilka is being seated and I'm up here because that's exactly what happened. The earth shook. After thousands of years of relative isolation, the tribes of the upper Great Lakes were influenced by a new source, a new force, the French fur trade. This 1907 painting depicts the arrival of Jean Nicolet making his spectacular appearance on the shores of Green Bay in 1634 wearing a grand robe of Chinese silk and firing his pistols in the air as frightened natives, supposedly Menominee, cower. We must remember that all post-contact history is through the white man's eyes. Historians now believe Jean Nicolet wasn't even on the shores of Green Bay at all, probably Marinette, but they agree that he was the first white man to hit these shores. Who followed Nicolet into this land? Explorers, missionaries, and traders. 
They brought items of trade, their ideas of governing, their ideas of ownership, and their religion. But with them, they also brought smallpox, cholera, measles, typhoid, scarlet fever, and influenza, which the natives had no immunity against. In the 30 years after Nicolay's arrival, for example, the Ho-Chunk population went from the thousands to the hundreds. Throughout this continent, figures as high as 90% of the native population was wiped out from these diseases. <clears throat> In 1673, Louis Joliet and Father Jacques Marquette made a four-month, 2,500-mile journey to this area using this route. This trail became the main traveled highway of the fur trade, establishing settlement life in Green Bay, Portage, Prairie du Chien, and Wisconsin, Peoria, Joliet, and Chicago in Illinois. No mention of Milwaukee. It was just a stopping off point for traders, missionaries. Though the area was heavily populated with native tribes, as Ilka explained, after the Iroquois were pacified in 1701, a year after Joliet and Marquette first journeyed here, Père Marquette returned and camped in Milwaukee. Probably not at a Marquette University dorm at that point, but that was later. Natives in the village of Milwaukee traded with the French and had a friendly relationship with them, even intermarrying. The natives had the furs, highly prized beaver pelts, among other furs, what did the natives exchange for the furs? Items the Europeans had that interested the natives were muskets and traps, hoes and kettles, beads and blankets. By the 1750s, European trade goods had virtually replaced native art artifacts. Gone were the reed baskets, clay pottery, quill decorative work, wooden items such as cooking utensils, farming implements, gaming pieces. They're in our museums, but after the 1750s, they weren't around here. Unfortunately, another item of exchange was alcohol. Alcohol abuse was prevalent among the natives and used against them. Another downside to the trade was that animals became a medium of exchange. Natives no longer gave ritual apologies and thanks to the spirits of the beaver or the bear after they were killed. During this trade, their pelts were just hauled to the nearest trading post. Because of reckless overhunting of the beaver, they became nearly extinct around Mackinac in the early 1700s. By 1800, the beaver was scarce even in eastern Wisconsin. <clears throat> in 1795, Milwaukee natives met a trader, Jacques Viaud, who began his career as a voyager paddling between Montreal and the Upper Great Lakes. Viaud married Angeline Roy, a trader daughter of French and Menominee ancestry. They settled in Milwaukee and built this cabin. The family had a panoramic view of the beautiful Menominee Valley. Vio traded in the Milwaukee area for 40 years. In about 1818, Jacques Vio met Solomon Juno. Perhaps on Mackinac Island, Jacques was more than 30 years older than Solomon Juno. Juno became Vio's clerk and protege and lived in that log cabin. Vio had at least 12 children and one of his daughters, Josette, married Juno in 1820. She was 17 and he was 27. She was a quarter Menominee. Solomon Juno gradually took over the fur trade business from his father-in-law. 
he and Josette moved into a cabin trading post of their own at what is now the corner of North Water Street and East Wisconsin Avenue. There's a plaque there today that marks the spot of this post. Uh, Juno's brother, Pierre, lived in a crude cabin just south. This area offered dependably dry ground above the mouth of the Milwaukee River. There was a solid relationship with the local tribes. Juno learned to speak Potawatomi and Menominee fluently. He had a reputation for being a very fair trader. They had, he and Josette had, at least 13 children who survived infancy. Josette helped the women in the settlement by being a midwife, nurse, and hostess. She knew the natives near the settlement by name and helped keep peace among the white settlers and the natives. By 18, the 1820s, beaver were nearly extinct in the region. The fashion industry in Europe had changed. The silk hat replaced the beaver hat by 1830. Machine-produced clothing was preferred over expensive furs. The smallpox epidemic in 1831-32 ravaged the population of native hunters during the spring hunting season. Natives couldn't pay back in furs the supplies they bought on credit because there weren't enough hunters or animals to hunt. Vio couldn't recoup his losses. He died in poverty at the age of 90 on his farm outside of Green Bay. But at this point, Juno stayed in Milwaukee, the only trader in a changing land. He and his native suppliers needed the land to stay as it was. The newly arrived white settlers needed to change the land and remove the natives. Sadly, the Indians' partnership with the earth that lasted 12,000 years disappeared completely. Solomon Juno saw it coming. In 1831, he became an American citizen, taught himself English. He joined up with a Yankee financial partner, Morgan Martin, and put up with the brash Byron Kilborn and became Milwaukee's first mayor in 1846. A large contingency of the local natives unwillingly left this area and went west. And Judy, will explain what happens after that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting us here today. We enjoy so much what we talk about. <laughs> um, I'm also a, a walking tour guide for Historic Milwaukee, and that does influence also some of the things that I bring to this. In any case, I'd like to, is this working for you? In any case, I would like to start with the uh, background to the treaties that were signed, uh, pushing the native populations beyond the Mississippi River. So what were some of the forces in American life that were uh, behind those treaties? First of all, the completion of the Erie Canal in 1825. I like to uh, use the example of my great-great-grandfather who could have gotten off the boat from Alsace-Lorraine uh, in New York and hip-hopped across Manhattan, uh, gone up the Hudson River and got on the Erie Canal and the rest was, you know, he was almost to Wisconsin. Um, so opening up the Erie Canal had a big influence uh, in wanting to push the natives out of the land. Um, it moved, it precipitated the movement of the Yankees into the Northwest Territories. Another important factor uh, was the inauguration of Andrew Jackson in 1829. Um, some of you are probably familiar with the fact that Andrew Jackson, within a year of taking the presidential office, put in place the Indian Removal Act. Um, and the Indian Removal Act then um, effect, it 
what moved forward many of the treaties. It was responsible for the Trail of Tears we hear about. And there wasn't just one Trail of Tears. There were a number of Trail of Tears, if you will, some from the, the Southeast and some from the Midwest. Uh, the two ter uh, treaties that I want to look at would be the Treaty of Prairie Duchene in 1829 and then the Chicago Treaty of 1832. The um, Treaty of the Prairie Duchene Treaty in 1829 was one of 12 major treaties in which the Potawatomi people relinquished um, now, I have to tell you the story. This, this is a quote, relinquished as part of a quote, but I used that word without thinking once on a walking tour, and historic Milwaukee got a vehement criticism by a tour group that I used the word relinquished, so I've never used it again in my own, in my own speaking, but it's part of the quote. They relinquished most of their land in the southern Great Lakes to the United States, during the treaty negotiations at Prairie du Chien, the United States officials pressured native leaders to cede territories in northern Illinois and in southwestern Wisconsin, parts of which were already occupied by American intruders. Uh, the treaty furthered the U.S. government's gradual movement of the Potawatomi people to lands west of the Mississippi. The second treaty was the Treaty of Chicago in 1833, and that struck an agreement between the government, the Chippewa, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi. It required them to cede five million acres of land, including reservations in Illinois, the Wisconsin Territory, and the Michigan Territory, and to again move west of the Mississippi River. Um, the treaty was one of the removal treaties to come after the passage of the Indian Removal Act. And it was the second treaty referred to as the Treaty of Chicago. It brings to mind something that came across my desk this morning. I just, this is totally, un well, it is somewhat related, uh, the movement west of the Mississippi. Uh, my brother sent me an email this morning telling me that Martin Sorcisi has, uh, has made a film of Killers of the August Moon. Uh, and apparently it received quite favorable acclaim at the um, Keynes Film Festival. Some of you know what that's about. In any case, let me go on then. Uh, as Catherine uh, stated for us and, and talked about, the last of the fur traders was uh, Jacques Bio and um, Solomon Juno. Uh, and as the fur trade was actually, it was dying out and the beavers and some of the other animals that were being traded, they were also disappearing from the land. Interesting, as an, another aside, uh, we once, within the last 10 years, we had a, a docent trainee who was a, a descendant of Jacques Vio. And we've, every now and then we run into people who are descendants of Solomon Juno, so they're still around. As the uh, fur traders disappeared and was dying up, with the, the Treaty of Chicago, the United States government put the land up for sale. And uh, several surveyors came to survey the land here around Milwaukee. One was Brian Kilborn. He was a Yankee from Connecticut. And he brought with him as kind of an apprentice the Increase Lapham, who was also a Yankee from New York, and I believe he was a, a Quaker. The original purchasers of the land here, when the Milwaukee land went up for sale, Solomon Juno with Morgan Martin, as Catherine pointed out, Brian Kilborn, George Walker. George Walker had set up a trading post just south of the Menominee River um, about this time. He was, he was another Yankee. He was from Virginia. I make that distinction because I'm going to refer to it in just a minute, Yankees or the immigrants who are most of our ancestors. In any case, Brian uh, Kilborn, uh, George Walker, and Solomon Juno each bought 160 acres of land in 1835. Um, Juno was on the east side of the river, and his land was on the east side of the river. Think of Yankee Hill or um, Juno Town. Uh, Brian Kilborn was on the west side of the river. Think about the river in Juno. 
Uh, it wasn't named Juno at the time because he was a fierce competitor of Juno, but Brian Kilborn was on the west side of the river, and George Walker was just uh, south of the Menominee River. As I said, they each had 160 acres for a dollar and a quarter per acre, and their intention was to develop the site and sell the lots, which they began to do. All right, now I'd like to describe the land. This is, these are some of my favorite stories because it's something we should all be so proud of, ultimately. Uh, Bob is going to put a slide up. Yes, isn't that an absolutely stunning drawing? Um, all of the land of downtown Wisconsin and what I re refer to today as you probably do too, the Menominee River Valley, close your eyes when you're there and imagine that that whole area, where's the map, Bob? Can we have a map? Yes, uh, the one with, yes, if you look at this, um, this is hard to do, uh, you can see uh, Lake Michigan here, and the M Milwaukee River comes down, and it meets the Menominee River, and then the KK comes out from the south. So this was the landscape of Milwaukee uh, when the Europeans started to come or when the fur traders were here. It was three rivers joining together coming into the lake, and, and we still have that today. But at the time, this was all marsh and swamp. And just to kind of make drive home my point, uh, City Hall, next time you're in City Hall, think of the fact that it sits on 2,500 wooden pilings sunk into the marsh. And some years ago, as I was giving tours, I came across an article in the New York Times with a picture of City Hall and the whole complex where the rep is. And the theme of the article was, can cities afford to prop up their buildings? Because <laughs> we're sinking. As some of you heard on the news last night, New York City is too. In any case, uh, the whole of the Menominee River Valley was a marsh, it was a swamp, it was surrounded by high bluffs. It was a wild rice marsh. And as uh, John Gertis is, loves to say, it was a grocery store for the native people. They could get their wild rice there in the fall. Uh, they could fish, they could, uh, there was waterfowl there. Um, you know, there was a lot of uh, things that they could use and they could use the rivers for travel and drinking water. Uh, and then the bluffs surrounding the, the marsh, um, they could grow their beans and corn and squash. Okay, so that is that. The first purchasers of the land uh, of, that Brian Kilborn and George Walker and Juno were selling, this is in 1835, 1836. Uh, ja um, Andrew Jackson is still president. But the lands were opened up who were the first immigrants to come here? They weren't immigrants, they were, they were Yankees. Uh, some of the names we still hold with us today, Brian Kilborn, uh, Increase Lapham, uh, George Walker, uh, Kilborn was a Connecticut Yankee, Lapham from upstate New York, George Walker from, I guess I said that already, from Virginia, Daniel Wells was from Maine, uh, Plankington, not sure where he was from, Gimbel's brothers came up from Indiana, uh, they, and they filled in the marsh. As uh, Milwaukee grew, as the city became incorporated and we had more and more um, immigrants coming, uh, they built around the perimeter of the valley. There were first uh, railroads and railroad yards. Uh, there were industries of ever-increasing size. Uh, they filled in the valley uh, with dirt, with gravel, and ultimately with garbage. And I met an engineer one time giving a tour and he said, yes, we were doing some drilling in the valley to examine it for building, and they came across some of the garbage. So think of the Menominee River Valley that you probably see often uh, as once the wild rice marsh, and then filled in, not only filled in for building, but it became the, uh, Milwaukee became the, um, uh, the, for the machinery, you know, the, the machine shop of the world. And so it was heavy industry that was down there. Uh, it brought in a lot of immigrants. Some of the little villages around the Menominee River Valley, think of Merrill Park, those of you who are older. Um, think of Story Hill, Pigsville, were all um, little you know, neighborhoods that built up around the valley, especially in the Marquette area. Uh, and they drew immigrants. All of these factories drew immigrants. Um, by 1890, immigrants and their children made up 84% of the population 
the Germans being the largest, uh, creating a German Athens, and I think Bob has a picture. Yes, City Hall, which sits on 2,500 wooden pilings. In any case, it was built to look like a, a German city hall, and Milwaukee was a German Athens. If I had a lot more time, I'd go into what happened just prior to World War I here, with so many people speaking German and so many people with relatives in Germany, but that's a whole other story. Uh, so what was going on as I get near the conclusion of my remarks, what was going on was the destruction and the poisoning of the valley and the Milwaukee's waterways. We have descriptions of the waterways at the late end of the um, 19th century. Uh, some wanted to cover up the Milwaukee River because all the uh, garbage from the valley and from the, the horses and uh, the pigs that were running around, it had made the city and all the water stinky, worse than stinky. They were, they were uh, germ uh, habitats. Uh, so, so that was the destruction and poisoning of the valley. In the latter part of the 19th century, getting to where you are today, uh, with trolleys and automobiles, the ability of those with greater means to start uh, move away from the immediate city center and up along the lake shore. Uh, the notable mansions we visit on tours today, Villa Terrace, the Gust of Paps Mansion, and you could name a lot more that you, you know, have in your neighborhoods here, which were built by those that could move out of the Juno Hill area. Ultimately, the valley was restored. This is my most favorite story of all. Ultimately, as the semis came and the freeways came, all those big uh, corporations left the Menominee River Valley, it was an absolute toxic waste. It was a mess. The Menominee Valley business partners, at, over a period of years, were able to clean up the valley. And if you go to their website, um, I get their newsletter frequently, go to the Menominee Valley partners, and this is uh, what it states. Once Wisconsin's most visible eyesore, with hundreds of acres of vacant buildings and abandoned land, the valley has been transformed becoming a national bottle in economic development and environmental sustainability. It is on uh, a list of the top 10 um, of the Sierra Club for its environmental sustainability and uh, you know all that it has done to restore the land. Some of you are familiar with the Hank Aaron Trail, I'm sure, or uh, is it Seven Bridges Park? In any case, uh, I have one more. Yeah, uh, so that wild rice march has been restored. Now 45 acres of native plants are down there, and Garrett Trail, and it, there's just so much going on in the Menominee River Valley, so go to their, ribs, uh, their website. That's my story. I love telling it. I hope I didn't veer too far off point. So to get local, we're going to go back and look at three maps that we looked at before. Maps are not perfect. Old maps sometimes disagree with each other, and that may reflect changing conditions, but it also may reflect um, different views by people, different people doing the maps. You remember this one? This is after the uh, Potawatomi were forced by the Haudenosaunee um, into land that had previously been Menominee. Most of eastern Wisconsin and the oldest um, group in Wisconsin of Native Americans were Menominee, and others kind of overlapped with intermarried and so on and so forth. Um, this was a map that was said to be the way things were in 1786. This map of how things were at the time of the treaties in 18, uh, around 1830 show an interesting difference. If you'll see the pink, which is the Menominee in this map, goes all the way down on the coast almost to downtown Milwaukee, apparently including us here. Um, did the Menominee then expand and take over area that had been taken over by the Potawatomi, or was it more of a fluid situation in which some groups lived here at some time, some groups at other times? The short answer for Whitefish Bay and the region around us is that we've been uh, the home of Menominee, and we've been the home of Potawatomi displaced from elsewhere. But exactly when and how is a little different, difficult to say. Um, this map here that we looked at before is going to be a little hard for you to see, um, but I'll 
point some, uh, some, some highlights on it that are relevant for us. You notice at the very top it says Silver Spring Drive, okay? And so that's where now Silver Spring Drive is. So the very top of this map over by the lake is Whitefish Bay. Um, the, the topography is that it's bluff, of course, and that it's, on this map it shows that it's woods. There's other places on the map, and as the other speakers have mentioned, um, that are swamp, for instance, down in the downtown Milwaukee area. Um, the, the advantage of the flowing water and of the, uh, the, the land that then becomes wetlands around that flowing water has to do with food. And Native Americans didn't have permanent settlements in this area. They had semi-permanent semi settlements that they rotated among for seasons. And so, for instance, during fish run season, they would want to be down in the Milwaukee River where the fish were running, <laughs> not up here in Whitefish Bay, where you'd go down the bluff and you wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to catch lots of fish right along the shore. Um, at a, uh, uh, at a later season where the farming was going on, and my uh, colleagues mentioned the three sisters, by, by, by 2,000 years ago, uh, it had come to Wisconsin from Central America, the, the, the combination of corn, beans, and squash, both nutritive for people, but also replenishing to the soil because the beans will then put nitrogen back in the soil, uh, had become a common way for agriculture to begin and the Native Americans at the time that the Europeans came here were a combination of hunter-gatherers, still getting fishing and hunting and so on, gathering the rice, but also doing some agriculture. Uh, at other times of year, uh, they would go where the maple trees were, <laughs> like in the spring, to get the maple sap. And so uh, the, the, the camps that they had uh, were uh, based on wanting to get food at that time. The picture that Ilka showed of the Big Creek in Sturgeon Bay is actually an area that Donna and I got to visit. It was very exciting. Uh, it's a place that used to be the main uh, water coming into Sturgeon Bay before the canal was built. And uh, the archaeologists found there at a place called the Crossroads, which is a conservancy organization that has some land there, a 2,000-year-old site where there had been fire and there had been pottery pieces and they actually opened it up one day that we went and allowed the public to come participate in the archaeology. They, they let us get the shovels, not by the fire pit, which was particularly valuable to them, but nearby there, and put it on the screen and screen things through. We weren't seeing um, pieces of pottery, but we were seeing things like um, fish vertebrae that had been there for 2,000 years, and it's what the life was like. Okay, back to Whitefish Bay. Here we are up in a bluff in the woods. It's possible that people lived here in this location at times. Uh, for instance, in the winter time, the groups tend to disperse out into the woods because the only way they were getting food, besides ice fishing, which wasn't very productive, was by hunting. The animals were dispersed in the woods, and instead of being in villages at that time, it was more advantageous to get, find something to hunt to be out with your own family away from other families, and this may or may not have been a place for that. Another thing to look at in this map is the dots, and you can't see them very well, but the black dots are where Latham found mounds. And mounds are not always associated with settlements, but you can see that the dots tend to be along places along the Milwaukee River, right? Um, there may be some out the Menominee River. But look way up where we are, and in the woods, there, there's no mounds there. Um, we don't have archaeological evidence. It's not that there's none there. It may be right out in our front yard here. <laughs> There's a fire pit like we saw at Big Creek. But there, we haven't found archaeological evidence of settlements here. Uh, but we know that there were settlements nearby. Okay? Let's go to the land grant. In 1835, the grants in Whitefish Bay, and this is in a southern part of Whitefish Bay, were for large plots of land of like 70 acres, 80 acres, 131 acres, not up at the limit that Kilbourne and so on were doing down in the Milwaukee uh, downtown. They went up to the limit of 160. But these are relatively large plots of land that were bought by speculators. Another map that I'm going to show you of smaller plots of ground at a later point in time, 
this one from 17, 1876, so the Native Americans were already long gone, but we're getting into what happened in Whitefish Bay as Native Americans were being dispersed. I won't say disperse or relinquishing, right? They were being dispersed. Notice the size of the plots, and the acres are on there, and our plot is Consol. You see right there in the middle? That's on the left-hand side of Consol, Santa Monica. The double line at the bottom is Silver Spring, and the top is, uh, is, is Lakeview, okay? And so the Consol family owned this. What happened is that the land speculators that bought from the Native Americans, or let's say they bought from the federal government who stole from the Native Americans, right? Uh, and then the lots were divided down uh, for mostly farming. What was going on is these kinds of houses. This is the second oldest standing house in Whitefish Bay. It's down in the southern part of Whitefish Bay. The oldest is actually near us. It's right around the corner uh, beside the bank across from where the Christian Science Church used to be. It's, it's blue now, probably wasn't blue then, but it's a frame house. This is a, a brick house that was built uh, down in southern Whitefish Bay. Um, the, the farming that was going on at the time, and this is again 50 years after the Native Americans were forced out, was stuff like this. When Native Americans were farming their plots with corn beans and squash and perhaps other things, they weren't using horses and plows and so on and so forth. Uh, another dwelling from that time is of particular interest to me because I live in this house. This is across the street from Santa Monica, Bol uh, from Santa Monica School on the console property. Remember I showed you that rectangle. Uh, the first house that was built that's still standing in Whitefish Bay behind the bank was the console main family house. And our house was built as the bunkhouse for the farmhands around 1870. Okay. There are other console houses on our block that were built for sons of the uh, console family. And by the time this picture was taken in 1892, uh, one of the console sons was living there and the house had been uh, refurbished with things like the, the, the windows from the first Sears catalog. Okay. So as Whitefish Bay was growing, it was still farms. You can see what it looked like in some of the commercial buildings. This was down on, um, d down on Silver Spring, and it was a grocery store school and a meeting place. Uh, uh, but we can see even as late as 19, uh, 1916 here, uh, we had farms still here in Whitefish Bay that were more of the um, modern type of farm that is being uh, done by the Westerners as opposed to farming by the uh, Native Americans. It would be cool if we and other parishes could say, our land was where the Ho-Chunks were. Our land is where the Potawatomi were. And the real answer is, the best we can tell, it was probably some people at different times over the millennia and the last few hundred years. I'm gonna pause there and see if you have questions for us or comments about what we know uh, and what we don't know um, here in the uh, answer or the attempted answer to the bishop's question. Could you say a few words about the movements today here in, in Wisconsin uh, where the native peoples are trying to rebuild uh, their food um, independence? Uh, a cooperation with Marquette University and other organizations, including native organizations, is actually trying to replant in the Menominee Valley some wild rice. It doesn't grow there naturally on its own, but it's hoped that it can be. There are places up north where it still grows naturally, even though it's been disrupted by dams and that kind of stuff. One more thing I'll mention, um, in the museum, and I think that in this group too, we want to recognize that we're being asked history questions and we're paying a lot of attention to history. But the most important thing, and this is what we tell the kids on the tours is, Native Americans are with us today. That there are over 50,000 Native Americans in Wisconsin. And, and I'm fond of telling the kids in the school groups that come through, you know, if all the Native Americans in Wisconsin were to gather together in the place where the brewers play, they would more than fill all the seats and be having lots of seats on the field too. And so we have an alive, and in many cases, a vibrant set of communities where um, the history is important, but the fact that we have Native Americans with us now too is very important. Okay, other questions? Were there any...
Any kind of reparations for this land that that was stolen? I mean, has there been a history of any kind of reparation? Zippo. No. Um, as the land has been used and abused, uh, there have been attempts to claw back. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, for a long time, uh, government contracted organizations managed, mismanaged, the lumber on the Menominee uh, forestry. And when the Menominee have been managing the lumber, it's been sustainable. On the other hand, interestingly, the Menominee, when they've managed both the lumbering and the processing of the wood, the sawmills, have done it for full employment of the people that are working there rather than for economic competitiveness. And so they've never made, a, the, the, it, when they've been managing, they've not made profits so much. Mm -hmm. what, what's making profits now and the sort of indirect reparations is all the casinos. They are re re recouping money that mm -hmm. basically was lost through the loss of land. Because if you look around the world, in Fiji, in New Zealand, they are, there are attempts to, for reparation, for unjust treaties. We can hope. Yeah. Microphone, please. For the recording. For the people at home. Uh, where did the gravel, the sand, the fill-in product come from? That, that fascinates me. You needed a lot of gravel. Um, where all of that came from, um, we're told, is from the, the mounds that were surrounding the, uh, surrounding the valley, the, you know, the, the wild rice marsh and the swamp. Uh, that was downtown and that was ended up being the Menominee River Valley. Uh, there were mounds surrounding that, which is where they grew their crops. But when the Europeans came or the Yankees came, they started to, to, to level those mounds to the extent they could, but they also filled it with garbage. Um, and, and that's what we're told they filled it with. So does that make sense to you? Okay. Hi. Uh, how many docents are there at the museum? Acti actively. Dozens. There's six of us in the Native American area. And so docents get trained in one or more areas. Um, Judy has the um, honor of being uh, the docent who's been trained in the most areas. And so she gives tours in streets of old Milwaukee, for instance, to. It just means I'm very old. Uh, senior, she's senior. Anyway, um, some of those dozens are no longer active, um, and, and I would guess it's something like three dozen or so who are probably... I think it's 23. 23 who are active now. But we would love to have more docents. Um, uh, Ilka is the head of the, the docent organization, or, or is the assistant head now and will be the head in a year. Okay. Were the mounds considered sacred? Were the mounds considered sacred? Um, like the mounds that we saw in the Milwaukee area, yes, they are definitely considered sacred. Unfortunately, as all, you know, no humans are perfect. So when the Europeans came in and they started plowing fields and planting crops, they're like, dang mounds, it's just, you know, knock them down. So yeah, sacred sites were destroyed by uh, imperfect humans. Anything else? Yes, oh, let me get you the microphone. Um, when I am at meetings or I hear on the radio broadcasts from certain areas, it is becoming more common for people to say we are broadcasting from Lakota land or we are meeting on uh, traditional land. But should we assume, as is the case for Milwaukee, that it's more likely that more peoples, more tribes were there and maybe it isn't as simple as one? Is that, is that also common in other areas other than Milwaukee? It's common everywhere. I mean, think of the millennia. Think of the reasons for moving. 
and the idea of one nation or one tribe being in a place for 10,000 years just doesn't really fly. So we can say, because it's very uh, well established that the Menominee are the oldest uh, offshoot from the general woodlands here in, uh, in Wisconsin, we're from the land of the Menominee, but, but also the Potawatomi, but also the Ho-Chunk, up north also the Ojibwa, Chippewa, who actually came and migrated through Canada even earlier than the Beaver Wars, not because of somebody forcing them. Um, they had an interesting um, legend that they were going to be moving eventually to a place where food grows on water. And there may have been other forces that were forcing them to move too, but they also as part of their legend that they were going towards something. Yes, several, not one. I just want to add, Edgewood College in Madison has a number of mounds that have been preserved that are near the near lake, uh, whichever lake it is, I can't remember. But anyway, they're there. Uh, I could add to that uh, what um, Sharon said. Uh, I was at Edgewood College for 21 years, and I was there for the building of some of the for buildings. And we had to get permission from the, I believe, the State Historical Society. I don't think it was the County Historical Society, but they had to come in and examine the land and see that there, we were not uh, going to be building on mounds. And as Sharon said, there are, uh, there was one right out my, my office window up there. <laughs> so, thanks. Okay, we are out of time. Thank you so much for your questions and your insights. Thank you, thank you. And again, speaking not as a museum representative now, because this is an independent group doing a program, do come see us at the museum.